Welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the daily show podcast that goes a little deeper into topics and segments that originally aired on the show. This is what you got to think of this show as, all right? Like, the daily show is like having your mama in your life, and this podcast is when your daddy come around. He'd be like, oh, cool, my daddy's back, and he loves me, and he gives me a warm hug. But we're not your mama. We ain't going to be as good as your mama. But you still kind of need it. Okay, I don't know if that's the worst analogy I've ever made to start this podcast. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you may have saw or heard recently in the news that Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin went into cardiac arrest during a Monday night football game earlier this month. He's made great strides towards recovery. He's been released from the hospital. He's back in Buffalo at this time. But the incident still sparked conversations on the issue of the safety of players in the NFL. To help us take a deeper dive into NFL safety, we have with us again CBS Morning's host, Nate Burleson. Nate, how you doing, brother man? I'm good. I'm good. And that analogy makes perfect sense. You know, the, the, the dad comes around and he, he he walks up to his child. He say, come here. Let me let me let me bring you to the other room. I need, I need to tell you about life. And, you, and he, places, <laughs> he places his hand on our shoulder and then he continues to keep it all the way real. And that's what we do on this podcast. Yeah. And you see him once a week. Just like this podcast. Listen, Nate, <laughs> I feel like you're a friend of the pod, so we can kind of yeah. kick back a little bit. Thank you of for course. making time with us again on a very important issue. Uh, yeah. First and foremost, let's just talk about DeMar Hamlin first. Talk to me about your feelings watching this injury play out. Because I was, I was at an event in New York, and I just saw Monday Night Football, and then I saw CPR creeping up my Twitter mm. trends. And I saw football and CPR. I'm like, what the hell is it? What CPR danger? Oh, no. Right. So as that played out live on television, the debate was, of course, should they continue the game? Should they stop the game? And there's been criticism about how the NFL responded. How do you, as a former player, feel the league handled this situation? Well, first, let me talk about what happened when I saw the, the injury, we'll call it. Um, and and that, that's probably a, a light way to describe it. Um, it was jarring, um, shock and awe, but not all as in, oh, it was like, oh, damn, like what is happening in front yeah. of our eyes? And immediately I knew this was different than any other injury. And I've seen it all. I've seen bones crack and break. I've seen ligaments torn. I've seen concussions, guys Ooh. knocked out. I've had those injuries myself. But seeing him go to the ground and then both teams surround him, other guys turning their head in the camera angle from a bird's eye view, not really getting into the interior of what was going on, all the while cutting back and forth to the studio, I immediately knew that this was an injury unlike we've ever seen. Now, when the response from the NFL really started to unfold, one, I will say the response from the doctors in the immediate area, the trainers, the medics, Everybody involved, they were as heroic and as brilliant as ever. And this isn't me putting on a cape. One thing I try not to do when we talk is is wear this shield on my chest and and say everything right that is going to be right for the NFL because I'm a former player and I still work. I keep it real. You talk about the NFL like you got cut in the preseason. (laughs) Well, I have to keep it real because really that's the only way that people will respect our honesty when talking about these subjects. Now. I say that they were brilliant brilliant in their response because they absolutely were. Talking to people that work in the medical field, talking to doctors that reached out to me voluntarily, they said the room for error was so minute that any misstep, any miscommunication amongst all of those voices crowding over this body, and some might describe it as a lifeless body at certain points, any Mm -hmm. type of miscommunication could have cost him his life or severely damaged him for the rest of his life. Um, and they were able to perform what we know now as a miracle. And we, listen, we hope and pray that DeMar continues to heal up. Um, but at, in that moment, things could have went left, all the way left. And we will be having a different discussion about why didn't they do more in time to sl- save this man's life? Now, can they do more? I think that's a tougher question to ask in the grand scheme of things. I know that looking at what happened, They might be even quicker when I just told you that their quickness and their response time helped save this man's life. So um, that was the toughest thing. Now, as far as the NFL NFL moving forward, it's like this. As football players, we oftentimes say the league gets bigger and faster and stronger. 
And I know that to be true. When I came in in 2003, I thought my 42-inch vertical and my 4-4 was fast. And some of the guys that were at my combine running 4-3s <laughs> were fast. But since then, you've seen guys jump 45, 46 inches. You've seen guys run 4-3s, low 4-3s, 4-2s, low 4-2s, which means that we as a league, as players, study what has happened before us, and then we train to get faster when the time comes for us to perform. I bring all that up is because I think this moment in time is going to be studied. And when we have our league meetings and when these doctors get together and these trainers get together, they're going to talk about this moment in time. And they're going to figure out how to respond even faster, even quicker. Now, as far as the X's and O's, to keep it all the way around, I can care less about football. I can care less about that game. People are like, well, what about that game and the playoff implications? Who cares about that? When a man's life is on the line. And if you can break down strength of schedule, win percentage, how many games you won at home versus on the road, and then you come up yeah, you come up with some type of system that allows you to see things correctly, I'm good with that. Now the fans might say, Well, Nate, come on, man. What about home field advantage? I mean, this is the postseason. What are you talking about? (laughs) Let me break it to you, man. When it comes to the playoffs, the best teams are gonna win. Rarely will a crowd, and I know you as fans, you feel like you have an impact on every game, which you do. I am not being dismissive for, to what you bring to the game. But in the postseason, it's about the best players and the best coaches, which is why coaches that don't step up get exposed by coaches that know what they're doing, and players that choke in the moment, they are overshadowed by players that know what they're doing and rise to the occasion in the postseason. So this whole home field advantage and the league messing it up, it's not that serious. I know that there isn't much of a comparison to what happened with with Brother Hamlin, but talk to me a little bit about that psyche on the field when you mm. see a beloved teammate go down and the play clock is back on 40 and counting down and you got to go get your ass back in the huddle. The, the card is taking this man off the field. Talk to yeah. me a little bit about what goes on huh. in the mind of a player you know, have yeah. you ever been on the field and had to struggle with continuing to play? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a couple of stories. Um, you know, one time when I was in college, we were having a spring game, which is an inter-squad scrimmage, and I dove That's for, for a ball. for the boosters and the diehards. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. they like, who, who are we about to look at this season and hand some $100 handshakes to? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I dove for this ball, right, and I caught it with my hands and fully parallel to the ground. And as I was trying to bring it in, my helmet hit the ground before my body did, and I was out. I didn't realize it, of course. So when I come to, which I found out was around 20 seconds, which is a long time to be laying on the ground uh, motionless. So when I get up, the last thing you remember when the lights come back on is literally the last thing you remember. So I'm like, oh, I caught this ball. Let me go back to the huddle. And I go to run to the huddle, and everybody's grabbing me. All these trains are like, Nate, 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 calm down. I'm like, what are you doing? Where's everybody at? Where I thought the huddle and the practice would be, nobody was there. They're like, Nate, calm down, relax, breathe. You were out for a little bit. You might have a concussion. And I'm like, what? Wait, what's going on? What happened to practice? Coach moved the practice to the other side of the field. The reason I bring that up is because coach moved the practice to the other side of the field. When I actually calmed down and took a breath, I looked to the other side of the field. Those guys weren't overly concerned with me. They were trying to finish practice. Um, now, things are a little bit different nowadays because there is some sensitivity, both from the outside perspective, being fans in the stands and watching at home, but also coaches and players. But I wanted to share that story is because the show must go on. And I remember I said that shortly after this incident happened, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't dismissive or insensitive, insensitive to DeMar Hamlin and his family and, and me sitting here saying the show must go on as if I can care less about him. That's not it. What it is is – Yeah, Skip being, Bayless stepped in it too in a yeah, he similar stepped vein. In it. It, yeah, he really well, did. He, and, stepped and look, square, he stepped squarely in it. But. He stepped squarely in it. And somebody – this is a segue, our side note, um, a tangent, if you will. Somebody said, well, Skip Bayless needs to read the room. I think, he, I think he does read the room, and he puts out tweets like that to get a reaction. And what he realized, the reaction he got after that tweet wasn't the one that he wanted, and he was out of pocket for it, and I'm not afraid yeah. to say that. And then he, back, um, he backpedaled. Yeah, he backpedaled. But, but, but I, I, I wanted to make sure when I said that um, that I conveyed that, and, and I think people, they were receptive to the fact I wasn't being dismissive. But I say the show must go on because we have to see 
injuries. We have to see guys get knocked out. We have to see torn ACLs, broken ribs. We have to deal with these things ourselves. And what we do know is that if we're okay to play, if we could walk, we could run, if we could run, we could jog, and we don't have injuries, being hurt is different. If we don't have injuries that's going to restrict our play, we have to go back on the field. And have to is up for that. That's see, see, that's up for debate. Like some would say, I don't have to do anything. But the way I think about it, I'm paid to do a job, and if I can't do it, I have to do it. Even if mentally in the moment. I might be a little unfit, and I have to take whatever it is, compartmentalize it, put it in the box, and wait until after the game to address these things. They say football is war, and that's a soldier's mentality, but how did you feel when you came to and look up and like, damn, ain't nobody over here, don't nobody care about me? Or does that type of compassion happen in the locker room after practice when they go, yo, you good? Yeah. And you was, that- you was snoring, <laughs> though, you yeah. was out. Yeah. Nah, like, the 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 – the sensitivity is on the sideline in real time. Like, if somebody has a concussion, this is what happened. We all wait. We're all, like, on pins and needles. Now, we're playing in the game. We're focused. Say the field is in front of me. But in between plays, it's like, hey, yo, yo. Yo, what what happened? What happened to, to Craig? Craig, all right? He good? One eye on the injury tent where they had him. Right, now. right. Okay. Well, he, hey, you know, we heard he's in the locker room. But, um, you know, he, he gave a thumbs up on the way. In. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Oh, what happened? What happened to, to, to Chris? The, the ACL? Was it the ACL? Now, they say it's just a sprain, but they're going to do MRIs after. Okay, cool, cool. We'll talk to him on the plane. Like, that does happen. Okay. Now, I have to keep it real. Um, you know, grown men are like, adult teenagers so there are times when a guy has an injury and he's and he's doing okay and that's where the jokes come and i know we're not trying to be funny right now but there has been some moments where a guy is slightly concussed where he might have got a little woozy a little lightheaded he wasn't like knocked out completely and then we get to the sideline and the trainers are doing the okay um (laughs) what month is it um when's your birthday Who's your favorite superhero? Count backwards from 12. And then they come back. Who's your favorite superhero? When's your birthday? What month is it? So they do this whole test. And then you know what happens. Five of your closest friends on the team come over and be like, hey, bro, you good? How many fingers am I holding up? You straight? Who your favorite stripper? (laughs) What city got the best chicken wings? Just making up concussion questions. Just just making up questions. And you're like, man, watch out, man. I'm good. I'm ready to play. (laughs) So there is this fine balance where we know when it's serious, we have to, you know, have this approach that allows our teammate to know, like, we got his back. But it is it is something we have to come to grips with. And that was one of the biggest things that I was concerned with when it came to the Buffalo Bills players and the Cincinnati Bengals players. Like, it's one thing to have the physical freedom to go out there and play football. I think players have all figured out a way to take whatever their worries, their anxieties, their fears, even depression, whether it's work-related, finance-related, relationships-related, and put all those all of those things in a box. Like that was literally my prayer. God, allow me to put these things that are on my way and on my spirit in a box. And then after the game, allow me to get back to that box and deal with them after football. So we have a way of compartmentalizing physically. But I think the difficult thing, especially in this situation, is these players coming back on the field and being mentally free. But where the league is now, I do feel like the Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals organization, they have offered um, therapy if guys so do choose. Nice. So much more to discuss on this, and we'll do that right after the break. This is Beyond the Scenes. Now, do you think the magnitude of Hamlin's injury was eye-opening to the fans? We know that the players probably already, as you've already stated, have some awareness of their mortality on the field, but you got to keep doing the job. It is what it is. And the OGs from the past, well, at least y'all got pads. We didn't have no face mask in my day. Play with three fingers. Yeah, smoking cigarettes at halftime, working on railroad (laughs) tracks in the offseason. Literally, literally. Facts, facts. So I'll tell you the most gruesome NFL injury I remember witnessing as a fan. It was Monday Night Football, Raiders, Niners. Ken Norton tackled Napoleon Kaufman up the Mm. middle, and he rolled his shin and broke it in two places. And I distinctly remember over the sound of whatever mics they had on the field, hearing Napoleon Kaufman scream. Like I was in college or something when this happened. And we were in the dorm. We were in the TV room in the dorm. We was like, yo, that's not. And before they, like, and TV showed the replay before realizing exactly how gruesome it was. And even Al right. Michaels was like, yo, don't show that. No more. TV has the advantage of always popping to the wide shot. Let's go to a commercial. Like, it's not like 
a lot of other sports where the injury is right there and you can see in basketball you can clearly see when somebody's hurt there's not the, the stadium ain't big enough right to cut to the super wide shot so you can see yeah. what happens to an ankle yeah. but in football you can't hide cpr mm. there's no way to even if you go wide there's clearly something happening the emotion on the players around mm. it just said something different how do you think this will change how fans view how violent football is did this make new i don't want to say opponents of the sport did it make more people aware of the real mortality? Because like you said, most of the gruesome stuff you see, it's a bunch yeah. of people crowded around. We don't see the bone come out the leg. Yeah. You see yeah. it. Yeah. But TV's never going to show that. So how how eye-opening do you think the magnitude of this incident was for fans? I think it was very eye-opening. And and it was, it was sobering, you know, to the extent that fans who feel like we are these warriors we are invincible that we might get banged up but eventually we'll be back we might get knocked down but eventually we'll dust ourselves off and get back up fans that think like that next play mentality i think there is this um this connectivity that they have with the moment now when somebody gets injured versus like somebody going down and then it goes to commercial break and you're like let me go grab some chips and let me know when the game's back on now I think fans understand like how real it can get. Now I don't think there will be more opposition to the game because there's certain sports where the physicality is just part of it. I mean, so there's some aspects of soccer with the collisions and the headers. I know rugby isn't necessarily a national sport here in the States, but it's a big sport all around the world. Um, you have boxing and MMA. I mean, the, those mm -hmm. sports speak, speak for themselves. And then, of course, football. You know, these guys are massive and they're athletes who just cause these collisions that are unlike any other. And to be honest, it's part of the sport. And a lot of these collisions we love because it makes the game. I'll, I'll take you inside my kitchen when it happened. And I think this will answer your question as well. You know, I was sitting there and I'm just having this conversation with, with what had just happened. And it's, it's quiet. Um, you know, it's so quiet in the house you could hear a pin drop. Um, and I have 18 year old, 16 year old, and 12 year old. So usually somebody's talking, somebody's cracking jokes. There's some type of music playing, but there wasn't in that moment. And my wife, she's talking out loud and she says, you know, this is why I just don't want our sons playing football. Now, mind you, my, my sons have been playing football since they were young and still do in high school. Ooh. And they both want to go off to college and play football and then possibly play in the NFL, which is the ultimate goal. My 16-year-old is sitting there, and he's just casually eating his food. He looks over. Here's his mom. I'm to his right. He takes another bite, and he's like, Mom, I'm still going to play football. And he was like, things like this don't happen often. And before I could come in and wear this cape for the NFL or just the sport of football and say, yeah, honey, you know, this doesn't happen that often. I couldn't do that in that moment because I wanted to validate her feelings. I didn't want to ignore where she was at and how she was speaking and how she was feeling in that moment. But at the same time, I, I, I also understand what my son is saying because I've been playing football since I was eight years old. I retired when I was 33, played 11 years in the NFL. I've had some injuries, don't get me wrong, but I've had tackles and hits that were way worse than what DeMar Hamlin took. That I just wasn't on the receiving routine. end. The super routine, so it, it's, it, it's not, it's not to say, oh, we shouldn't be concerned about a DeMar Hamlin hit. It's, it's to say that those type of hits happen often and the result isn't the same, especially in the way that DeMar Hamlin went down. So, you know, it's it's tough because I hear when people say, I don't want my kids playing this sport and it's too violent. Who am I to say yeah. that they're wrong after what they saw? But I also can speak from the other perspective saying, you know, I know plenty of people, more people that made it through this sport on the other side and are able to walk away, run away and play ball with their kids in their 40s, 50s and 60s. So that's why I can I can see see the see it from both lenses. Yeah, I spoke with a former player. It wasn't a perfect one to one and he agreed, but he said it's like he said it's like auto racing. There are deaths and people mm. die, but the frequency of death in auto racing is not that high. Yeah. Yeah. Comparative to the risk that is taken week after week after week by all of these NASCAR drivers and all of the safety precautions that have put in been put in since Dale Earnhardt. So I right. understand that. So then off the point that you just said about players who are able to still walk and, you know, 
have their mobility and cognitive skills on the mm-hmm. other side of retirement, you know, Hamlet's recovering a little faster, you know, than doctors expect. He's got a long way to go, but he's not fully covered, or at least wasn't. Going into that game, Yeah, the way his contract, excuse me, the way the collective bargaining between the league and the Players Association was set up was right. that traditionally a player like DeMar wouldn't get his medical care guaranteed into for life, if I'm not mistaken, that's what the NFL said. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know it keeps they keep updating this. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um, there is um, a the way that's planning you, to protect him, right? Or take I, care I, of him. I, I, I would say so. I would say okay. the Buffalo Bills and and also the NFL will take care of him. Um, see, the plan was to push for better benefits, and you know this isn't an isolated NFL issue. I feel like, you know, every person that works for any type of corporate infrastructure pushes for more benefits. And it's okay for NFL players to say, you know, we want a more extended version of our insurance or maybe even life um, time insurance, but you have to be vested. You have to be three years, three games, I believe it is somewhere around there before you can be covered for that. Um, and then also a young guy on his first deal, you know, his money wasn't all guaranteed. So where does that leave him financially? I think there was divine intervention on both parts. One, to save his life, all the things that had to happen up until he was in a hospital still fighting for his life. But also, I think it was there was divine intervention because he set up his foundation and or his charitable cause and he had this GoFundMe and wanted to raise 2500 bucks. Like that to right there. Toys for kids Christmas. I think about if he didn't set that up. Or if he wasn't a guy that wasn't wasn't giving to his community in the way that he did, that prompted all of this. So, you know, him having a little bit of a financial cushion through that GoFundMe is, I know, mostly going to go to his charity. Charity, but also, I think it's going to help him set up his life um, in the NFL and the Buffalo Bills will allow him to. The bigger question is, what about guys who don't have a charitable cause or have this? This outpouring of support, yeah, like your we did injury for Jamar. wasn't on television, commercial free for forty minutes. Exactly, exactly. We have to call it what it is. What is the NFL going to do moving forward? And I think, as players, we look in the mirror and we figure out the best way we can be even better versions of the athlete we are on the field. In this moment, the NFL has to look in the mirror and figure out the best way to be the best sports professional sports organization out there and then um, special professional sports league out there and then be better when guys go down and they can't take another snap. Beyond the scenes, we are back and talking player safety in the NFL. So Nate, beyond finances, what are yeah. some other ways that the NFL can protect their players? You know, do you think, first off, do you think the league is doing all they can? To protect the players' minds and bodies and, and bank accounts. All they can? I don't think the league is doing all that they can. I think they're doing the best job that they can. And 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 that, okay. that isn't a, a cop-out. Um, no, that, that's, that's fair. Me, that, that's me saying that until the league knows how much they really can do, then they're going to do the best version of what they think is taking care of their players physically and mentally. What our job is, the NFLPA and the people that are in charge of fighting for not only current players and newly retired players, but also we're still fighting for guys from the early 2000s, 90s, 80s, 70s, you know, 60s. We want to fight for those guys as well. And I didn't have the benefit of the research who didn't have the benefits of research, who didn't have the benefits in general that we um, have. You know, we all oftentimes talk about when it comes from struggle to now finding any type of freedom in any space. We say, well, well, they walked so we could run. And it's true. But we have to run and then pass that that money back down to the OGs. I do think lifetime benefits, you know, whether it's some scale of insurance, we have to continue to push for that lifetime support when it comes to physical rehab for injuries that you're going to have. It's inevitable. I said this on TV and I'll keep repeating this so people really understand. The injury rate in the NFL is 100%. You will get banged up. 
Now, of course, the degree is different. It's everything from a sprained ankle where you come back in a week or two to an ACL that'll sit you out for six to nine months, all the way to concussions and something like something that happened to DeMar. The DeMar example is extreme, but I'm, all I'm saying is if that is true, the injury rate is 100%, the NFL should offer something, some type of um, physical rehab that a, a guy can lean on post-career until the day he dies. And then the availability of – Fun as a kickers. Well, kickers Don't are people that. too. Kickers are people too. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Uh, and then that, and then mental health. Having you know the uh, the ability to reach out at any given time, whether it's individually or it's couples therapy or it's just work related. And here's the thing: I want people to to know this. The NFL does offer these things right now for former players. You can reach out to them and say, "Hey, I need therapy." They will find therapists in your area, give you five free sessions, and then figure out if you want to move forward. Same thing with rehab. And there's a ton of benefits. Players do have to realize if they make a phone call to the NFL headquarters or the NFL PA, they will send them an email, a long laundry list of things that you actually get the hookup on. And we all love a good hookup. Yeah, so then with the same thing goes for pension then because I know that a lot of guys deal with – with post-retirement depression because football is the only thing you've done since you were eight or nine years old. That's all you know. And so now you're 35 and what next, what do I do? And yeah. trying to find job placement, you know, in that capacity as well. How do you feel, you know, because when you, when we talk about guaranteed country, all right, so, so everything you're talking about are things that need to happen, right? Baseball is guaranteed money dollar for dollar, even if you suck, even if you leave the league. Bobby Bonilla is still getting paid. He has not played baseball in 15 years. NBA money is guaranteed dollar for yeah, dollar. NHL yeah. dollar for dollar. Yeah. How likely, and I know this is pie in the sky, but how likely, give, just give me a percentage-wise. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Percentage-wise, what is the likelihood of the NFL ever offering guaranteed contracts, which could help to give players the money they need to do all of that other stuff? I would say 90%. Like in the next collective bargaining, in the next collective bargaining, now yeah. with Hamlin's injury on television and the public sentiment changing against the league, yeah, does that swing the tide in the favor of the Players Association at yes. the next collective bargaining situation and could guarantee contracts – what is the what is the percentages that guaranteed I, I, contracts could happen? I would say ninety percent, and we've been trending in that direction for a while now. Like we see it every off season. We'll see, and, and and mind you, it's the superstars, right? It's the it's the quarterbacks, the big time linebackers, the big running backs, receivers, tight ends, et cetera. You know, but we've been seeing it though. I've been seeing some of these contracts. I'm like, yo, that, that looked like a baseball contract that quarterback just signed. But, Did you but, see? But, and not to cut you off, but don't no, some of those bigger contracts, like say like a Russell Wilson, like I know. Deshaun Watson's money in Cleveland is guaranteed dollar for dollar. That is right. unheard of. But it seems like a lot of the bigger star contracts, they front load them with signing bonuses. Yeah, true. To make the rest of the players in the league go, see, one day you can get a nice big <laughs> lump sum. Of yeah. Bitch, lump sum ain't dollar for dollar. Right. That's a fact. So, and, and in those big contracts, pull away from some of these younger guys. So, so the yes. question is, how do, do we find the balance? Like, it, it's, it's great to congratulate these quarterbacks that just made a killing. Oh, man, you got 200 million guarantee? Oh, man, that's all right. But what about the young dude who's fighting for his first big bag, who got in and, and, and got handed a $200,000 check? He's making 700000 but none of it's guaranteed. And we don't know if he's going to make it to his next contract, let alone a, a second or third. So I, I think the, the bigger question is, when will the league – start to make the contracts for the second tier and third tier players on these teams fully guaranteed, or at least as close as possible. And I believe we're headed in that direction. One, because for a long time, it's been the NFL, I mean, the, the NFL who's looking up at the NBA and Major League Baseball for a long time. And now that we're starting to see it a little bit with the big superstars, it's going to trickle down at some point to the rest of the squad. Now, if we're looking at the NFL, of course, from their standpoint, they're like, man, we're paying everybody fully guaranteed money. Some of these guys aren't going to last, whether it's due to injury, getting cut, released, or traded. I don't want to pay everybody every single dollar. Oh, well, the NFL is making so much money that they do have the ability to. And there's going to have to be some compromise when it comes to these owners. YouTube just paid a 
billion dollars for Sunday ticket. Come on, man. Come on. Bitch, they I want my dollar money. for dollar. I want my dollar for dollar. That's a fact. And, and I believe we are heading in that direction. And here's the thing. The more we know about what goes on behind the curtain, which is stuff like that, you're talking about how much money the league is making, that's when we become unapologetic in our demands. I remember when I first got in the league, I was thinking to myself, man, I'd, I'd run through a brick wall for this team. Man, I'd, I'd, I'd bleed and die for these colors. This is everything that I love. And you're like, I don't care if they're paying me. You know, because you hear the whispers, man, I'll give my right arm to play in the NFL. Because you've been playing anything. for free your whole life, and a couple hundred dollar handshakes ain't a real salary. That's right. cute, but that ain't a salary. So, of right. course, you come into it with, yeah, I do it, of I course. Do it for free. I do it for free. But then there was one day I woke up, and I just picked up a newspaper, and I started doing some research, and I realized how much money the <laughs> NFL is making, how much these teams are making individually, and how much money they're driving in, whether it's butts and seats, ticket sales, merchandise. Collectively, they are making so much bread that we have to get our slice. So I, I think now that we realize how much money is out there on the table, it's easier for us to negotiate what we really want. I think that the DeMar Hamlin incident on Monday Night Football also turned a lot of the people who were quick to say, well, I would love to get a $200,000 just to catch a ball. Like those people who have no sympathy for players and feel like the players already get enough and they're just rich crybabies. I think it's even turning them into understanding, no, we are taking real risks. This is not like your job. I need more money. There's a, there's a very human aspect of this that I think we all felt. You know, um, DeMar's uncle said, before the game, he was my nephew. After the game, after the incident, he was America's nephew. And I thought that was a dope comment because mm. it, it put it all in perspective. Now, you know, these fans who might be somewhat callous to what we go through as athletes that just care about the end results, wins, playoff wins in the Super Bowl for their home team or a fantasy football championship, yelling at the screen, calling us garbage, telling us to hurry up and heal up from an injury, walking away from the TV as soon as the guy goes down because you want the game to resume. I think now you look at the game, now you look at the players, now you look at the moments when guys go down a little bit differently. And... And if we all can grow from that, I think we'll be better from that. Well, Nate Burleson, I love you, brother. I love Thank you too, you so man. Much Appreciate you, brother. For giving us a little bit of your time. We look for you as always on CBS Mornings. And uh send my best to Gail and the gang and no Vlad doubt. and everybody. No doubt. <laughs> all do, right, brother. brother. Appreciate you. Thank you for going beyond the scenes with me. All right.